So meanwhile, Dr. Jagadab, let me just formally make a, a, yes, an yes. opening you remark. Please go ahead. So welcome to all the uh, colleagues who have joined us today. And we are very sincerely, we sincerely apologize for the inconvenience caused in the wait by about 20 minutes due to modern day glitches, which can happen to any of us. The systems don't start uh, when we really want them. So thank you for uh, being with us. And, uh, today we joined for the National uh, Science Day celebration at HBNI. Uh, we all know, of course, I don't need to tell you that uh, this is to commemorate the discovery of the Raman effect <coughs> by Sir C. V. Raman on 68 February. Uh, uh, that being a holiday, we thought that it's better that uh, we meet on first. And that's why we are here. And we are very, very happy that uh, Professor B. N. Jagatap has uh, agreed to join us and uh, yes uh, very we was very particular that uh, i should keep the introduction very very short and i also know that uh, we have lost a lot of time therefore let's just let me say in a few lines uh, this year's uh, uh, team for the national science day is education and society and i think uh, dr jagatap has played a key role in all of them he has been a researcher, he has been a guide to students, he has been a teacher, he has been part of HBNI, and now he is part of IIT Mumbai. He has carried out several that have had a bearing on the utilization of science in society. And over and above all this, he is an excellent teacher and excellent uh, orator. And uh, therefore, it is a great pleasure to have him with us. In the last uh, one or two years, I also uh, focused on science education. He has made a lot, a lot of contributions to studies on contribution I mean, on education sector. And therefore, uh, he is well read on this subject and is the correct person to speak to us. So, Dr. Jagadha, please. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor uh, uh, Vasudev Rao. Uh, not only for giving me an invitation to speak here, but also it's an opportunity for me of homecoming. Uh, this day is the cricket, and therefore every cricketer would like to play on his home pitch. So today, I am going to play on my home pitch. Uh, so let me begin with a few slides. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes. Okay. Uh, at the outset, let me tell you that what I'm going to tell you is not going to be very profound. Many of the issues you would have thought about yourself, might have read elsewhere. The only credit to me probably is putting them in a, in a talk of one hour or so and providing some logic behind everything what is happening. So let me begin by uh, giving you the warm greetings on the National Science Day 2021. And this is a day when uh, we celebrate the life and work of Professor C.V. Raman. And he was a man of extraordinary vigor, energy, and self-belief. Before I take the discussion on the topic, let me bring out to you some of the extraordinary things in the life of Professor C.V. Raman. And these are anyway going to be the backdrop of the discussion of today. The first one is Raman was a homegrown scientist and he remained Indian to the core. He received his formal training entirely in India. Except for some months abroad, he worked only in India. In 1924, he visited Toronto to attend a conference and then spent some time at Caltech. He built his own equipment, costing rupees 500 at that time, and a profound history. This needs to be told to the students of today. And what he had said about uh, this is it was poverty and the poor laboratories that gave me the determination to do the best I could. He believed that the essence of science was independent thinking, hard work, and not equipment. And he said, ask right questions and nature will open doors to her secret. So we need to ask today, are we asking the right questions? And this is all about discussing the topic of today. 
The theme, as uh, Professor Rao said, is the future of science, technology, and innovation impact on education, skill, and work. In fact, this particular theme integrates many things. It's not only science technology. It's also the sociology, the economics, and also the cultural part of it. And this is an integration. It's going to be very difficult to discuss this topic. However, my first impression after reading this theme was this, that this theme puts science and technology and innovation at the center position in the future scheme of things. And we scientists should be extremely happy about it. If the future of India has to be built, then it has to be based on science, technology, and innovation entirely. However, the word future also makes you, makes, sensitizes you that is it calling you for delineating a new path that will lead to the national prosperity and equitable economic growth? Because it's, it's impact on education, skill, work, and therefore it's going to be on the economic growth of the country. And third, what I felt was that this theme provides a clear national objective for science and technology endeavors. And this objective is consistent with the aspiration of young India. When I say clear national objective, what I mean is we have individual objectives. We have institutional objectives, departmental objectives. But is there an objective which can be uh, which can cover every one of us, all the institutes, all, all the scientists, and all people, the students, and the entire community. So this is providing a national objective. Now, this particular topic, I, have, I thought that I should uh, uh, rephrase this topic, and this is what is the discussion that I'm going to have today. Seeking convergence of science, education, and society in new India. Now, Tormanjas, you can see the backdrop of this particular slide, and we know what the convergence means. However, I need to define here what I mean by the new India. And that new India is here. If you look at the working age population in the country, uh, we know that. Uh, it is that the working age population is growing. And this is the stage at which we should start harvesting the demographic dividend. This word has been used so many times. When the working group age population is more than the dependent population, then this is the period where the countries harvest the economic progress. And that exactly is the demographic dividend. And there is a picture on China here. The China, the working age population was highest in 2010. And we know, and also we will see in today's presentation, that from 2010, how uh, China picked up and he has become, it has become a number two economy. In India, we are having a growth of the working age population. So, whether that demographic dividend is going to actually accrue or it's an elusive demographic dividend. That's the question we need to ask. And that is that new India, which I have in my presentation. Why do we say so? Now, if you look at the unemployment rate in figures, these are the youth unemployment rates. They have been rising from 17.83% in 2000 uh, today, in 2020, we talk about a figure like 23.75%. And as I was mentioning yesterday in a function, the minister of Kerala government said that this is not 23.75%, but it's 40% in Kerala. So that's the kind of problem we are facing here. So you want to get the demographic dividend, then these working hands need work. And that is what is the whole issue here that are we going to generate a new education, new jobs, and new skills through the ambit of science, technology, and innovation? It's a challenge which has been thrown to the scientists and technologists of this country. So this is the first issue. The second issue is uh, 
We also hear in the newspapers that India is poised to become a 5 trillion economy. Today, it is 2.7 trillion GDP. And this prediction was made sometime in 2017, and I have brought that figure uh, to you. Uh, and by 2025, we should be about 5 trillion economy based on the 2017 figures. And we should become then the third largest economy in the world. Today, it is 2.73 trillion. In the next three, four years, we need to double it. How are we going to do it? That's the question that we all need to ask. On the other hand, let me spend little time on uh, GDP per capita, which is the real meaningful measure of economic prosperity. And this, was, uh, this plot was drawn sometime in 2013, still relevant today. We will uh, put the figures for 2020 a little later. What it says is that in 2013, India's GDP per capita was 1,505. China's GDP was 6,747. And here you see the figure for United States, 53,101. Now this plot assumes two things, that Indian economy grows at 8% per annum, and other economies do not grow at all. They remain stagnant at 2013 position. In that case, how many years is it going to take India to catch up with this major economies? And the numbers what we have are really mind boggling. That it will take us 20 years to catch up with China. If China does not grow at all from the 2013 year, that means in 2033, our per capita GDP will be that of China. Whereas if you look at United States, it's going to take us 47 years to match with United States if United States does not grow at all. And this is a contrasting situation where we talk about third largest economy by 2025, but in the per capita GDP, we are lagging so much. And if we want to know the figures of 2020, they are here. Our per capita GDP is now 1,877. And there was hue and cry in 2020, uh, middle of 2020, that the Bangladesh per capita GDP is $2,000. So they have overtaken us. On the other hand, the China's GDP has per capita is now about $8,000. And for United States, it's about $63,000. How are we going to match these figures? And what it means is that we need to grow faster than 8%, but what are the solutions? What are the, uh, how, how are we going to do that? And this is just for uh, little information. This, I'm going to refer to this uh, numbers a little later. <clears throat> you take the Indian economy and ask about the sectorial contributions. The services sector contributes about 52%, agriculture is 16%, manufacturing is 18%, and manufacturing services, that is gas, electricity, and so on and so forth, they contribute about 13%. Um, now, if you compare uh, India and China, for India, the manufacturing is 18% of GDP, and its share in the world manufacture is nearly 1.8%. Whereas in China, it is 34% of the GDP of China, and it contributes about 14% to the world manufacture. Now, for the last 10 years, we have been talking about achieving manufacturing to the 25% of GDP in the globalized world. But somehow, it has not happened. But an important thing that we need to note is that Indian economy has become more and more capital-intensive economy. And therefore, its potential to create new jobs is weakening day by day. This particular thing I'm going to explain to you a uh, little later. So this is the India that we are today talking about. And therefore, uh, all these issues, if you put together and sit in an air-conditioned room, 
then we'll talk about many things like uh, we need appropriate education, we need appropriate science, we need appropriate technology, we need to foster innovations, we need to create new knowledge, technologies, applications, we need to do skill development, creating new avenues of employment. This is all what we discuss. This is basically the convergence of science and education and society we are talking. This is at the back of our mind. But how are we going to do it? That's the question. And uh, I have spent five years interacting with the academic world in the universities and also. And then certain things emerged out of it. I have been thinking about this uh, and that is what I'm going to present it today. Now, why do we need to work on convergence? This question will not be asked in United Kingdom. It will not be asked in uh, USA or any other in country which got industrialized much ahead of us. The answer lies that the initial trajectories of education, science and work, they have been absolutely divergent. This is the most important thing. And as soon as we recognize that these trajectories of education, science and work had been different in, new, in modern India, that is when the English education started in this country, 1835 or so. And these trajectories went along their own ways. And now we need to ask this question with this historical baggage, how do we bring them together? How do we make them converge? And that's the discussion which I'm going to have. And for this, I need a lot of background, much of it which you know. First one, is if you look at the history of Indian GDP, this has been done by the August Madison uh, in the economic history in 2003. I have just brought here the curve corresponding to India. And you can see here India in the early years before 1700 or so was contributing more than 20, 30% to the world GDP. In fact, if you read Ancient Indian Commerce, a very nicely nice book by Baba Sahib Ambedkar, you will find that the India before 1700 was uh, an entrepreneurial country. It had trades, and uh, even Baba Sahib Ambedkar writes that there were corporates working in this country. They were in a different form, and uh, every household was. Uh, was a place where man, some manufacturing, some productivity was going on. And that's how India was maintaining that position. And then comes the period from, this is basically the British rule, and uh, where the deindustrialization of India started. And that's what is shown here in the red uh, color. And there is a beautiful article in the Explorations in Economic History, published in 2008, deindustrialization of India in 18th and 19th century, the Mughal decline, climate shocks, and the British industrial ascent. Basically, it was to create a market for the British goods. Therefore, local arts, local skills, local manufacture was all destroyed in this process. What was it replaced with? And this is where we again talk about the trajectory of education and job in this country. Beneath this uh, slide, there's a famous uh, statement by Charles Grant. Once English knowledge was imparted to the Asiatics, their faculty of reasoning would be restored and they would rise to the scale of human being. So the entire objective was the moral and mental improvement of the natives, as they were called. So the English Education Act, 1835, and the Woods Dispatch, 1854, which uh, paved the way for universities in this country, the main objective was this vast empire. It required uh, labor, it required clerks, it required also teachers and munsips. So these were the factories to generate that. And most important thing that you need to understand here that in that education, there was no skill component. And there was extraordinarily high emphasis on literature and humanities. The British education system did not support sciences. We'll come to that a little later. Unfortunately, what has happened, this whole mindset that uh, the skillless education 
with an emphasis on literature and humanities still continues today. If you look at the survey, annual survey of higher education, Asher, then you find that in 2018-19, the total number of registrations in the BA in this country is 98.9 lakhs. Compared to that, you see in the science, ESCs, it's about 45 to 48 lakhs. This is what we are still carrying. It's a no-skill education. It's still continuing in spite of the several uh, education uh, reforms that were intended. This is not to say that British did not start technical education. But the technical education was entirely with the imperial interest. And then we talk about the Rurki College of Engineering established in 1848. It was basically to produce those sub-assistant engineers and overseers, the subordinate class of engineers who would materially aid European engineers. The Grand Medical College started in Mumbai in 1845, primarily to uh, produce these medical assistants. The, commentary that was given that time was that the European doctors, when they come to India, they are on the higher side of the age and they would require somebody to interpret and somebody to help. The survey schools, well, this whole vast subcontinent was to be surveyed. So some schools on the surveyors for the topographers started. This is all that we think in the British time. But what it generated? It generated a correlation of education is equal to government job. And this particular mind state still continues. So when we say that we need to prepare a new country, we need to see the historical trajectories and then we need to work on. This is the place where we need to work on the mindset of people. And the education, that education which does not involve any skill. Of course, the People, the natives, so-called natives, they argued against this particular type of education, but they were not successful. We will see those issues later. The science before independence. Now let's look at the trajectory. And uh, this trajectory is also interesting. And this is a period which is 1888 to 1945. Why 1888? That is the year when Jagdish Chandra Bose started his experiments in, at uh, Presidency College. And this is termed as the nationalistic phase of Indian science. The science was not supported, but thanks to uh, Mahendralal Sarkar and uh, Ashutosh Mukherjee, uh, Indian Association of Cultivation of Sciences was established as an indigenous effort in this country. And science and education, they became part of the freedom movement. This had, at that time, the freedom movement was at its peak. And this particular way, thinking that science is part of the freedom movement, you can see at the bottom here, what Acharya Praful Chandra writes in his letter to wife of freedom fighter Chittaranjan Das, when Chittaranjan Das was imprisoned, he says, I can assure you, however, dear sister, that in serving my favorite science, I have only one idea in mind, namely that through her, I should serve my country. Our aspirations are same. God knows I have no other objective in the mind. The point here was that the young people at that time, they wanted to prove to the British masters that we are, if not better, as good as you, in the intellectual capabilities. And this I always refer to why cricket started in Mumbai. The cricket started in Mumbai. Mumbai had four clubs, four or five clubs, Islam club, Muslim club, uh, then Hindu uh, Gymkhana, Parsi Gymkhana, and European Gymkhana. And the objective of the other three Gymkhanas was to beat the Europeans in their own game. And that's how Mumbai, became the uh, place where the cricket grew faster. So the same thing happened in sciences and education that we wanted to prove to the British masters that we can, we are as good as you are. That uh, earlier statement which I showed that we are of the inferior race 
No, it is not. We can do as good as. So that's how the science became part of the freedom movement. And then every name today we talk about is from this phase of Indian science. J.C. Bose, S.N. Bose, C.V. Raman, A.P.C. Ray, Meghnath Saha, so and so forth. But uh, on this day of National Science Day celebration, I would also like to point out that the first recorded discovery by an Indian was in 1867. That is Chintamani Raghunath Chari, who discovered a variable star, R reticula. But this is only for the records. Now, science being part of the independence movement, this trajectory, what did it really mean to us? The science being treated as an extension of freedom movement, it was seen as a pure intellectual exercise rather than a means towards production of wealth. And this, we all are inspired by J.C. Bose, S.N. Bose, C.V. Raman, and other people which we list here. And that inspiration is, uh, is derived in a sense that we need to prove to the world that we are intellectually superior. The science being a part of extension of freedom movement had this side, which we never understood. That is a pure intellectual exercise rather than a means towards production of wealth. S.N. Bose, in, in his interview at some point of time, he admits this. He says that, uh, well, we wanted to do something so that the technological advances can reach to our uh, people, but we could never do that. So this was the issue that we need to understand. So the trajectory has been entirely different as regards the science. Now, this is, on, this is up to the freedom. Let's talk about the science after independence. This is, I'm taking 1945 to 1992. 1945 is the establishment of Tata Institute for Fundamental Research. And this particular phase is very interesting and most of us have participated in this phase, where science and technology was seen as an integral part of nation. That was the objective. And this was led by people primarily Jhumi Jahangir Baba and then uh, Vikram Saravai. And the reflection of this, the nation building, is uh, you can see from Jhumi Baba's letter to Tata Trust, written in 1944, it is absolutely in the interest of India to have a rigorous school of research in fundamental physics. For such a school forms the spearhead of research, not only in less advanced branches of physics, but also in problems of immediate practical application in industry. Very important statement that was made there. Moreover, when nuclear energy has, uh, has been successfully applied for power production in say a couple of decades from now, India will not have to look abroad for its experts, but will find them readily at hand. And that is what the institutes, BRC, DAE has demonstrated. However, you can see also you, as an objective uh, student of a history, one should say that, well, this is the period when uh, large many new institutes were developed for science, technology, education, the IITs came during this phase. And the primary emphasis was on creating scientific and technological manpower. That was number one. And number two, since it was a nation building phase, we need to repeat several things which were done abroad much earlier. And therefore, the, uh, the research and developments, uh, they were not of the quality which we say, which happened in the first phase of Indian science. But then that is not an issue because you need to pay for the developing the infrastructure, the nation building is important. This is the stages at which we have been until 1992. Now, what happens after 1992, we'll come to that. But from 1945 to 1990, there were several things, several large number of thinking processes which were going on around the world. And I'll just show you what 
the, those uh, streams were the education on science from 1945 to 1992. Uh, the first one was the Cold War fallout. Uh, and that is where the education reforms in the United States started. And uh, there was a general sense in the American population that the schools and colleges in the United States are not providing the challenging education in science needed to maintain America's age as a center of scientific research in the post-World War II period. And the scientists from the laboratories, they entered into the education sector and they created the syllabi. And this was largely focused on the content of science. That is, focus was on facts, concepts, principles, and laboratory skills. And the purpose was to produce future scientists. He says this type of education just did not have any other objective in the mind, but to produce future scientists for the United States, this is a one-dimensional focus that it had. This was adopted in our country too. The second thing that happened was that with this content-based science education and content-based science research, was challenged by many philosophers. And they said that the content is not enough in science education. And this is the famous commentary by John Davy. Uh, and I'll read it out to you. From the standpoint of a child, the great waste in the school comes from his inability to utilize the experiences he gets outside the school in any complete and free way within the school itself. While on the other hand, he is unable to apply in daily life what he is learning in schools. And that is the total isolation of the school and its isolation from life. So this is the content is not enough. Today, in our education, since we did not reformulate it according to the newer thinking, uh, we teach in the colleges, teach in the schools, but we never, never tell them where it is applied and how they can apply the science they learn within the schools and colleges to the daily life problem. So this is another trait that we have. This is another interesting state statement that the handover of the control, handover of the control to the uh, scientist and the narrowing and abstraction of the discourse often put science beyond the realm and the language of understanding of ordinary children and indeed ordinary people. And therefore, there was another dimension got added to it in the science education. It is the context is important, but it's also the context. Why do we do science? What is its importance? That is making science learning relevant, addressing students' belief. Why is it worth learning? How does it connect with the real world? Connectivity, how science is connected to the everyday life, importance of science, science technology in the development of society, and application of science, how to apply the principles and generalizations learned in the classroom. So now this provides an integrated view. If you want to generate, let's say, if we keep hearing about this, that we should uh, create not job seekers, but job creators. For job creators, the application of science is important. Can he apply what he learns in the schools, college, or anywhere to the real life situation in, in society and come up with a solution? If that context is not provided in the education, it's not going to happen. And this particular two-dimensional approach, which is uh, in the science education, the content and context, this was also a uh, study ground for the researchers in the universities. And what happened was, at the same time, people came up with the application of science model. And this is uh, known as the partial quadrant model. They said, yes, fundamental understanding is important. That is plotted on the y-axis there. But to make the research relevant, you need to also look at what is the x-axis? Is it relevant? Is it application-oriented or not? And therefore, it generates these four quadrants. This is the quadrant where 
there is fundamental understanding and there is no application. This is the pure basic research Bohr's quadrant. This is why Mars, the most important quadrant where both fundamental understanding and application come in. The other one is uh, the second quadrant is uh, application, yes, but no fundamental understanding. This is sort of that jugad in the Indian language. This is called the Edison quadrant. And there is another quadrant, the third quadrant, where there is no fundamental understanding and there are no application. Well, this model came after the model for the science education in the world, that the content and context are important for science education. And in the same manner, the research and its application both are important. And we will see that we always have been giving several talks on this. This is where the maximum number of researchers should be concentrated, where they will work on some issue which, is, which gives rise to fundamental understanding as well as results in an application. Now, what these two models have done is they have established a harmony between scientific research in the universities and science education in the schools. So content and context and fundamental understanding and application, they go in hand. And this, uh, I'll just show you a few things, how the universities are harvesting that pasture quadrant model. Uh, this is a, a news item from New York University. And most important thing to note are those lines which are underlined, foster innovations to bridge the gap between basic and applied sciences and to look for opportunities to move discoveries from laboratory to the marketplace. Uh, this is a very interesting article from the Harvard University and Stanford University. The implication of pasture squadron for doctoral programs and faculty development. And also there are plenty of articles which are in this domain. The new world of discovery, invention and innovation, convergence of knowledge, technology, society. The important thing to note here is that, look, this whole idea is to establish the convergence of two things. One is the science education, with the content and context at the school college level, and the scientific research with the fundamental knowledge and applications that is in the research laboratories. And this is this synergy is extremely important for fostering the spirit of innovation, bridging the gap between basic and applied sciences, and realizing in, in Indian term what we call as lab to land approach. However, this all what had happened in other places, the trajectory of education was, as I described to you, uh, what happened before independence continued to uh, be extended in the post-independence time. In fact, in 1945, there was a, a, a commission which gave its report. It's a sergeant commission. And in 1945, that commission said that India's education is 40 years behind that of the United Kingdom. And therefore, we'll take 40 years to bring India's education at par with the United Kingdom. Of course, uh, uh, many, many people, patriotic people said 40 years is too long. And then British government made it 16 years. However, that plan was not uh, implemented. And that is where we come for the science after independence. That is just after this nation building phase was sort of taking momentum. The country went in for globalization. And the globalization phase started in 1992. And the objective now here uh, is to make India an international hub for innovation and convert it into a knowledge-based economy. Now, the, here, the context of research was redefined. It's a socio-economic development, international competitiveness, converting research into products and processes, innovations, entrepreneurship, everything eventually leading to the growth of GDP and employment opportunities. Now, the globalized phase the liberalization was not only a structural change, structural adjustments. Thus, adjustments should have happened in the science and technology and 
more importantly in the education sector. But unfortunately, it did not happen. And if it does not happen, then in the globalized world, if my student is not getting the right education in this country, he will go elsewhere and do his education. If I do not find uh, Indian and Indian equipment at par with the criteria of selection I have, I'm going to buy uh, equipment from abroad. So that international competitiveness had to be brought into it in a way. This is, this had to be done in a campaign mode. As I have shown you that the trajectory of education was take some skillless education and enter into the government jobs. The trajectory of science was to have an intellectual exercise. Uh, and this was the period when some convergence had to be brought about. It is not only the government job that is going to suffice. You should look jobs elsewhere. You can be job provider. That concept should have started in a big way in 1992. But we did not do it. What has happened? What has happened is, uh, if I just show you, please do not mind if I show you some statistics. What is India's ranking in 2020? Last year, we were hearing that India was third in publication of research. Well, then I collected other sociological indices and said that, let me compare our rank in publication with the rank in other social and economic indices. In the publication, we are three, patents per capita seven, innovation index 48, quality of life 59, technological advance 60, health 112, GDP per capita 122, human development index 129. Then just look at those countries which are just above us and just below us. What are those indices tell us? United States is number two in publications having healthy ranks in other indices. Germany is number four, is having very good indices in, in the sense. Japan, which is number sixth. Again, you can see the numbers in the health, GDP per capita, HDI, and the double digit numbers. And in China, which is uh, number one in publication, is number one in patents per capita. Its innovation index is much above us. Uh, the technological advance, it is 38. In HDI, it is 85. Now this table, does it not tell us that there is a disconnect between our research and society? And this is expected because the trajectory of, was, of science was easy in some other direction. This is for the intellectual pleasures and doing something at the fundamental level, not generation of wealth as we had seen in the, there were, there have been few exceptions like uh, Acharya Prakul Chandra Ray, who started uh, Bengal Chemicals and Pharmaceutical Works, but these are very few examples like that. And this is the disconnect people are talking today. This, when we are in our research laboratories, we don't uh, think much about this contrast. However, the criticism has started mounting. All of us know what Narayan Murthy said in IIC in 2015. Is there one invention, one technology, one idea produced by you that has helped make the society and the world a better place? There is an interesting article by Ross Bassett. He's a professor in North Carolina University. I just brought to you his interview in uh, Times of India. And the top one is interesting. And that's again is the, asking the same question. Indians in tech have done great things, but has India benefited? And that India is those bottom ranks of the human development index, GDP per capita, health, education. So has India benefited? And more direct was by science journalist Nagesh Hegde. This I was talking yesterday in some context. It is an irony, this, this, this took place in 2019. It is an irony that where our scientists can detect traces of methane on distance mass. Closer home, we see people getting asphyxiated in manholes. 
it is the role of science communicators to point out such dichotomies to decision makers so that the solutions of day-to-day -day problems of people could be developed and benefits of research reach everyone. Now, this is now making more explicit than Narayan Murthy's statement. So therefore, we come back again to this issue that, uh, well, these are the issues we think the appropriate education, science, technology, fostering innovation, creating new knowledge, skill development, creating newer avenues of employment, then the question that may arise in the science and technology community, do we think these issues are within the purview of our science and technology endeavors? This is the most likely question that is going to arise. I have phrased it in a different way. Do we think that these issues are beyond the purview of our science and technology endeavors? And that's the question that we need to discuss. I'll bring it to you something very interesting escape from my readings. Uh, this is Jenin Michal from the University of uh, Rouen. Here's an article. As the title itself is interesting. What science for what democracy? If you are in a democracy, then you should uh, work on science suitable for that democracy. So what he writes is, is there on one hand an eternal science more or less fantasized and on the other hand, a democracy that has to administer that science with a view to improving it. Now, this is this is really a problem a problem in the democracy. If we just go on the trajectory of science that we have been in the pre-independence time, and then he says, or more fundamentally, should we not be thinking in terms of the co-evolution of science and society? This is a very interesting statement that the whether science and society can co-evolve and that is what is the it is, it is inferred in that theme in an indirect way and therefore we need to ask this question that can science and research be contextualized if we say that in the science education needs to be contextualized to give the understanding of science and its application to a child or to a student, then the research also needs to be contextualized. Now, contextualizing science and technology is, is a big issue, but let me bring in some philosophical ideas here. Uh, this is from uh, Lacey and the, the famous book, uh, The Value and Scientific Understanding, Value and Objectivity in Science. Uh, in this article, is science value free? There he makes a statement, research must be impartial, but not neutral. That neutral means it cannot be indifferent. The researcher must be impartial. The laws of mechanics, laws of quantum physics, laws of chemistry, you don't go to the people to ask whether these laws are right or wrong. He needs to be impartial in his own judgment. But he cannot be neutral when it comes to the application of this. And that is what he says little uh, more, which I have brought his statements uh, dicto. Being involved in the interaction between science and society does not simply mean being aware of or involved with the application of their research. This also covers the framework in which the objectives of a research projects are defined. It's very, very, very important thing. And this contextualizing of science and technology becomes paramount importance, particularly in India, when the inspiration for research is external. Very little of our research is having inspiration from our internal problems. And the inspiration, since it is external, the other countries, suppose if it is United States, United States would have contextualized that research in in, 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 for their society, for their governors. Whereas if you bring it here, can we contextualize? And that's the big question that one has to ask. Now, let me bring, since I, I was talking in one physics department, so I had collected some slides on physics, and uh, I have just put the slides here. Uh, it was a very interesting uh, phrase, phrase 
which is called the Cold War and Hot Physics. Uh, the Cold War this started after the Second World War, and uh, it also involved the Sputnik, Vietnam War, Korean War. And the Cold War was a technological race for military supremacy. There, is a, there are two beautiful commentaries on this. One is by Don, Dan Kells, uh, Cold War and Hot Physics. And the second one is more important for the Indian context, the David Kaiser, Booms, Bust, and the World of Ideas, Enrollment Pressures and the Challenge of Specialization. This was brought into our places because of the Cold War. Now, what really had the technological race for the military supremacy was uh, in, uh, let me explain to you that, uh, as these authors say, that if the Cold War breaks into even half a war, there should be enough technological manpower available to run several of these Manhattan-like projects. And therefore, you have the enrollment of physicists in the universities. Uh, let the universities develop this uh, military research. And they were supported by the huge budget from the defense organization. And that's where the high energy physics, high energy accelerators, and so on and so forth came. And they were directly related to the guided missiles, anti-submarine warfare, ocean transport. In fact, uh, much of the fluid dynamics was developed for the ocean transport, evaluation of weapon systems, and so on and so forth. Now, this is an interesting plot. The physics PhDs granted by the university, US university, from 1900 to 2005. Unfortunately, in India, we do not keep such a statistics. But then you can see here that uh, when the Cold War started, and the Cold War ended in 1980, and this is where you have the bubble in the physics PhD enrollment. And when the bubble got burst in 1980, the physics, the PhD positions dropped by 47%, mass they dropped by 32%, chemistry 31%, and engineering 30%. And then there is also an employment statistics. The physicist job seekers versus number of positions. In 1968, for one job, four physicists were looking out for a job, whereas in 1971 got distorted, much before the Cold War bubble was over. It became 20 to 1. And then came another bubble, which was the Star War bubble, that is Strategic Defense Initiative in 1992. The, again, the physics PhDs uh, increased, and again, eventually dropped. I have been asking this question in the universities. What is happening? Is there a similar plot available uh, for the physics enrollment? There is nothing that we have here. We don't keep any statistics. Only thing that you understand is that for the last 20 years, the enrollment in physics has dropped sufficiently low. And that is what, again, is that effect. Some of the physics or ideas which were developed in the United States out of the Cold War, not contextualized in the Indian sense. And if you start doing in the universities, this is eventually that is going to happen. And that is what we also should ask, the contextualizing. What happens if that hot physics of the Cold War period is transplanted in India? The American system has shown that there were drops in the PhD enrollment and there were drops in the job prospect. What happens in the Indian situation? The second important thing which we have carried even today, which is carried by every one of us, this is the pressure to publish. And this is a very interesting graph which is given here again from the David Kaiser's uh, work, that uh, physics abstract, uh, if you scan, these are on the y-axis is physics abstracts uh, per year, and how they have grown over the years. And then it says that the first phase was 1920 to 1939, this is that phase, where doubling of the physics abstracts were happening every 13 years. And then came the Cold War period, so 1945 to 1973, the physics abstracts were doubling every six years. So many people were uh, uh, involved into that Cold War physics that they have to eventually publish. He also writes how the physical review, the journal the physicist always reviewed, had to split into physical review A, B, C, D, 
and there was a pressure to specialize and so on and so forth. And then the American system also started adjusting to the Cold War bubbles. And then in this case, you see the doubling is happening now in that period is 22 years. However, we have ditto taken that Cold War doubling in our systems and there is sufficient pressure on people to publish. And when I talk about contextualizing, now contextualizing science where there are grand India-centric challenges, but hardly anything is being done except in a few corners. For the last 70 years, we have been talking about drinking water. We have been talking about water management. We are talking about environment and pollution, regenerative and climate resilient agriculture, renewable energy, disaster management. Every time the disaster happens, we start looking to and say that, oh, we need to have some disaster management programs. Industrial productivity is abysmally low in this country. Are we working on that? Issues specific to urbanization, the transportation traffic in every city in the country is such a bad state. Is transport engineering not a technology subject? Technologies for smart cities and villages, are we going to import those technologies? Technology-based entrepreneurship, look, uh, this is something which I will talk a little later. We have uh, lots of votaries for the artificial intelligence, big data analytics, but is there anything happening for the social sectors? Affordable healthcare, do we have anything? Waste management, the only technology that we talk for the waste management is a broom and not anything worthwhile. Biodiversity and natural products and education technology, are they not the grand India-centric challenges? And these challenges are the real opportunity areas for the jobs and for, for entrepreneurship. Unfortunately, there is very, very rudimentary work that happens. In terms of water management, the only thing what we do is how to harvest rainwater. So you pit a, dig a pit and just uh, put water there. That's all the kind of technology we talk about. Whereas for solving water problems, I should not mention it here, but uh, this is a forum of scientists and technologists. Indian government has an Israeli water attached. Now, is it not uh, something that uh, uh, tells us that we need to do something on it? Now, let me take it little forward. Uh, there have been economic theories, how the countries grow economically, and there are uh, solo swan theory, and uh, these are the neoclassical theories, and uh, Paul Romer, uh, incidentally, Solo got Nobel Prize in Economics in 1985. Romer got Nobel Prize in Economics in 2018. Now, this knowledge exists with our economists. But the economists have not told the scientists and engineers that there is a knowledge like this. So let me uh, just give you just in two slides the technological progress in economic development. This is the first time uh, somebody puts the technological progress, how does it affect the economic growth of a country? And to do that, let me just draw a small uh, figure here. Uh, this is a scale figure. This is the capital per worker. And this is output per worker. This is basically GDP per worker. And it has got a shape like this, that initially if you start putting capital into the system, then the output will work will grow but at some point of time it is going to saturate and that is what the famous economic uh, statement a rise in capital accumulation and lower force will increase the economic growth rate but only temporarily because of diminishing returns so always your curve is going to be like this now this is where what i said to you earlier that indian industries uh, manufacturing sector has become capital intensive, you can see it from here. If you want to put more capital, then you are already on this uh, portion. And that is where you, you don't have many returns. And that return output per worker can be increased by reducing the number of workers. So that is the way the dynamics works in the economics. Now, Solo Swan introduced the idea of technical change. 
And what they say is once the steady state economy is reached, the economic growth can be increased only through innovation and improvement. And that is what is called as the technical change. So model they give is very simple that you have this curve like GDP per worker versus GDP capital per worker. Anyway, you start with some premises here, you are anyway going to saturate. And when you recognize there is a saturation, there needs to be a technical change. If you do that, then you are put in the higher orbit and that higher orbit, you start growing. But this is also going to saturate at some point of time. And that time you need to have another technical change coming into the system. So overall, the GDP growth for a given capital will grow like this. And this is, uh, well, this is not theoretical. This has been established that the United States achieved it from 1901 to 1951. China achieved it and many countries achieved it. The difference, if you want to see, is here. Uh, if you just plot the, how the GDP of China and India have uh, grown in recent years from 1990 to 2010, you can see that the innovation uh, issue in the China's economy is a runaway uh, economic growth that was achieved. This is what we have not recognized. And uh, what is the technical change? It is nothing great that also is specified. Discovery of new materials, new processes, new products, upward lift in production through technology innovation, technical progress in input, substitution of limitational inputs by new materials, lowering input-output ratio through innovation, improvement in the management and its structure. The question that we ask is, can India experience the effect of technical change on its GDP? Now, this is not a big job that we are asking for. And I was very fortunate that uh, uh, when I came to chemistry group, I learned a lot from my colleagues. And uh, uh, we put in some little bit of efforts in uh, realizing the solo swan model. I'll, I'll just give you one example. This is an example of high purity quartz. Now, uh, India produces quartz, the natural quartz, and which is impure. And there is some table given there that if your quartz is 99.5% pure, then the cost is $30. 99.8 is $150. And if you can have uh, 99.997, then the cost is $5,000. Now what Indian miners they were doing was to sell that natural quartz at a throwaway price. And you look at what are those impurities at the end of the day, you find that the impurities are aluminum, calcium, copper, iron, and some, some impurities like this uh, at some PPM level. So this is not a difficult job for a chemist. So people develop something and produce this quality parts, 99.997% parts. This is that technical change. When you introduce it into the industry, what has happened? The Indian company executive, he wrote a letter. And that's, words are pretty interesting. My company was exporting tons of quads and earning lakhs of rupees. Now it is exporting kilograms of high purity quads and earning crores of rupees. So that's a technical change that you introduce. A solo son was right. Uh, Dr. Jain Saab is here, so I'll show you another interesting example that uh, we were working on this with the diamond industries. The diamond industry, when they polish, they produce a large amount of diamond waste. And that waste is thrown for, uh, is thrown cheaply to make those uh, uh, polishing papers. So the company, this one company, when they came with a proposal that can this, can this not be converted into the diamond powder so that we can polish our diamonds with uh, this powder. Otherwise, they were importing that polishing powder from abroad. So this was done, taken up, and the diamond powder was made. This is no small technology. This is the top to bottom nanotechnology. Uh, so uh, let's not think that one is doing something for the poor people with the BSc knowledge, no. And with this, the diamonds were polished and uh, specifically turned diamonds polished with our powder. And this uh, technology was developed for Hare Krishna Diamond Exports. 
SORA. So this is the small technical change you provide, and then uh, the, the economics can be improved. And that is where you come to the industry academia collaboration. I don't want to talk about it, but I just want to point out something which I was reading in Made in China 2015 policy. And what it writes, this is a preamble. Since the beginning of industrial civilization, it has been proven repeatedly by the rise and fall of world powers that without strong manufacturing, there is no national prosperity. You have forgotten this. And what China did was it identified industry four technologies as the key elements for manufacturing. And today, India, China is a force to reckon with in industry 4.0. And if you look at the publications in artificial intelligence and machine learning, China boasts three universities in top 10. This is that win-win situation for both. And I must tell you that today the industry has more data than the academic world. And that data you can access only through this industry academia collaboration. Uh, let me not go through this, but uh, mention it here for a simple reason that uh, uh, innovation has been talked so much in this country but i found this definition pretty interesting and it says that innovation consists of three elements first you have to recognize the problem and that needs analytical thinking and that analytical thinking can come only if the content and context is taught to that person in his school or college otherwise it will not Second, you have to come up with a solution which is partly analytical and partly creative. The third element is implementation, which is the biggest part of the innovation. Now, if you start looking at the country as a whole, where are these innovations taking place? Innovation is not doing something great. Innovation is not going on Mars. Innovation is not going on moon. Look, innovation is something very simple, which can be used in day-to-day -day life and it can generate economic. Now, since our academic world, the education system in our universities is, I should not say bad, but that's the way it is. This is the issue which our youngsters do not understand. You've got to recognize a problem. And once you recognize a problem, it can always be solved. But if you go to the interiors of this country, you find the innovations going on there. This is the Hyderabad farmer who uh, developed vitamin D rich rice and wheat variety. Here is that Karnataka student Niranjan Kargi who produced, uh, developed the cheapest water filter, rupees 20. I hear that uh, this is being uh, now exported to African countries. Uh, and he, he has found, he's a founder of now Nirnal water filters. This is that Rajasthan student, Narayan Lal Gurjar. He saw the problem of agriculture in uh, Rajasthan and he developed eco-friendly water retention polymer, which is now helping the farmers in the country and down Kerala. Somebody thought that, well, these uh, coconut uh, peelers on the street, they're putting too much of energy and therefore he came up with a machine. What is the commonality between these people? That they are challenged by something what exists around them. And therefore, they wanted to come up with a solution to solve those problems. Unfortunately, the students in our universities, they're not being challenged. They're being challenged with the very small things like you do this, you do this research, and that, that's all, which has no contextuality. And that is what happened. While I say that, I proudly would like to show you a picture of our own colleague. Uh, this is uh, last year uh, on the Science Day, 28th February. There was an article, Can Coronavirus Change Indian Science for Good? And there was, an, uh, there was a picture of this uh, uh, machine, Microgo Chennai. And this is a disinfection device. And this person, Dr. Rachana Dave, who was our colleague in uh, water and steam chemistry division in chemistry group. He's, she is the founder and CEO of my group. So this is what is that the, there, are, there are innovations taking place. And recently she got uh, award from prime minister for 
innovation. This is one issue that from the instrument, look, the Raman developed his own instrument and got Nobel Prize. This particular uh, tradition of building equipments existed until 1980, 1990. Uh, I'm showing you here a picture of India's first electron microscope, which was uh, developed by Professor N.N. Basco, Pietas and And closer home, uh, this is the picture which I, uh, I have taken as a case study for some work. Uh, this is the gas chromatograph developed at PRC. The development took place between 68 to 71. And by Dr. R. M. Ayer, they built the first commercial equipment. The technology was transferred to Mrs. Toshniwal Brothers. And about 100 to 150 gas chromatograph units were produced and sold by Toshniwal. Then in 1996, they came up with an advanced version of this mass spectrometer, the hydrogen monitoring, uh, high multi stream uh, hydrogen. What happens then? What happens is that the globalization, it rang the bell of the demise of the local technological development. Everybody started buying those gas chromatograph, which were produced in Lithuania or some other countries. Why did it happen? And this was exactly the stage at which we should have developed, we should have uh, put this in a marketplace in a much better way. And there is a lesson also, the development of equipments are important for two things. First thing, it gives the skill development to our students, how to work around with the scientific principles and instrumentation. Without that, you're, we're going to produce PhDs without any skills. And also the economic benefit through commercialization and entrepreneurship development. And this has been very well said by the story of lasers. Those who understand this, for example, the lasers, laser was invented in 1960, and today laser is a multi-billion dollar industry. On the other hand, those who did not understand this, 1928, Raman developed the first Raman spectrometer. 1960, the lasers entered into the field and the development of laser Raman spectrometers, uh, stimulator Raman spectrometer, cars, micro Raman spectrometers started in the world. But the land of Raman did not participate in this development because this was not considered intellectual enough. And today, laser Raman spectrometer is a multi million dollar industry. And every laser Raman spectrometer that you see in Indian laboratories is an imported stuff. The flip side of this is also this. The history of science tells us that the Nobel Prizes have gone to those researchers who have developed their own equipments. It's not only Raman, but everybody develops his own equipment. And therefore, if you assume that we are going to get a Nobel Prize by doing our research on commercial equipments, well, that's not going to happen. The commercial equipment is for incremental research, not for testing pioneering ideas. Those pioneering ideas you need to create your own instrument or modify the existing one. We have totally forgotten this. Finally, I'll come to something which is, uh, which is close to my heart. I'll take five more minutes, that's all. Uh, I'll just bring this picture is a little away from what I have been speaking right up till now. Uh, look at the traditional pottery in South Korea and India, the left side and the right side. And what strikes to you is, uh, uh, at the bottom, you can see that this fellow has a wheel, which is uh, electricity operated, which has got lots of uh, uh, controls. Whereas this potter in India is still working with thousand year old technology. See that wheel and how he rotates, puts a stick and uh, rotates it. And then whatever, it also has the precisions and all that. And therefore he cannot do a very good job. And that speaks about the living style of the bodies. Now, if we do not provide anything to these people, their children, they will enter into the job market. And the traditional skills will be lost, their economies will be lost. And additionally, we are going to create people with unemployment. So if you just take the traditional knowledge and skills in this country, 
uh, I got the example of pottery, but you can see on the internet, the vidri where the, in the bidar there is a way to uh, do the zinc metallurgy. And that art is dying. And uh, they use some uh, soil from some place. And if you ask them, why do you use this soil? No, no, yahase banta hai. No scientist had ever gone and seen what is there in that soil which helps this fellow. Uh, this traditional skills form a part of the unorganized economy of India. And the figures are pretty interesting. The unorganized sector of economy, the manufacturing is 20% of the total manufacturing in the country. And it employs 80% of the manufacturing work. Now I make a very simple proposition that if by giving some science and technology inputs, if I can improve the productivity of this traditional knowledge and skill sector by 25%, then the Indian economy overall will gain 1% in GDP, and which is not small, it's a pretty big number. But this is a really a challenging area. Are our science and technology systems going to recognize this? Or are we going to continue to work with the single paradigm? And that's the question that we need to also ask on this question. And this, while I was speaking at one university, I wanted to sensitize them, therefore I introduced, I thought HBNI is also a university though virtual. Thomas Bender, in his book, The University and the City, makes a very interesting statement. Traditionally, universities have been seen as in rather than of a locality. Universities have always claimed the world, not its host cities as their domains. What it means is Mumbai University, what is it doing for the city of Mumbai? Delhi University, what is it doing for the city of Delhi? Or are they going to work only for the world? This is the contrast that happened in our thinking. Today's new world view is universities cannot be sustainable without being socially responsible. And this social responsibility, as Manchester University puts it, the way the university makes a difference to the social and economic well-being of communities through education, research, and public events and activities. Leicester University has uh, created a social connect program, PROUD. Uh, it's a very interesting one. P for promoting health and well-being, R for restoring environment, O for opening access to culture and heritage, and upskilling for the 21st century, which I just now talked about in the case of a potter, and developing children and young people. There is also the university social response network. The question that we ask is that can our universities provide that science and technology inputs to the local communities to enhance their productivity and living standards through their social programs? And there is enough science that can be done here. This is, uh, we know this, I don't need to repeat this. Our education system does a great job of getting students prepared for more education. Aim of primary school is to prepare a child for a secondary school. Aim of secondary school is to prepare for the college. The aim of the college is to prepare the student for master's or PhD. And after PhD, suddenly the student feels, what am I going to do? We do not prepare our students to go out and deal with real life. And that is what the skill education needs to be done. The skill education in the Indian system, as we talk, talked about the pre-independence time, the local thinkers, Indians, they were vehemently against that education that created only flux. And but only twice this issue was raised. Once it was in the Hunter Commission, 1882, where uh, uh, Jyotiba Phule made a case of inclusion of agriculture, lessons on moral duty, sanitation, technical education, and some useful art in the course of instruction. And then also says develop a small model farm near a school where the practical instruction on farming can be given. So it was not to be a theoretical one, but this was the idea that yes, we need that skill for going in the public domain. Those who do not get government services, where do they go? Then, in 1937, all the British policies did not mention the skill as a part of 
the education. Only again, it figured in, in the Saki Rusin Committee report in 1937. This was a backdrop of uh, Varda Conclave, which happened in 1937, 36, 37. And interestingly, this is what interests me a lot, that they proposed a syllabus for first to seventh standard. And what was that syllabus? Every hour, year, every day, the school will be work for only five hours and 30 minutes. And in five hours, 30 minutes, what do you do? The basic craft, I have just copied it from there, is more than half of this period, three hours, 20 minutes. For three hours, 20 minutes, provide that skill education to a child, and then some music, the mother tongue, and social studies, physical training, and all that. The rest of these things can be done at a later stage. And I'll tell you why it was. Zakir Hussain committee idea was that at least this will empower the students to pursue their skills as occupation after finishing full course. Well, this uh, report was foo-fooed by the modernists, saying that, oh, these are not carpentry and uh, pottery are not the skills to be taught. Well, you could replace those skills with the new skills, absolutely no problem. But the idea that the basic craft should be three hours and 20 minutes out of five hours and 30 minutes was an important issue. And this is where you generate those technicians. What do you do by craft education is you teach a child the brain, eye, and hand coordination. If you want to do good science, good technology, the person needs the brain, eye, and hand coordination. And that coordination you teach there, you can teach that coordination to spinning or to a pottery, it is just not, or some IT, it does not matter. But that is an important issue. However, this report also was not implemented. Now we have NEP 2020, which also talks about the basic crafts in the school. And again, they refer back to the carpentry and pottery. And therefore the dilemma in our education has been whether it should be knowledge or skill. Again, it can be explained using the two dimensional plot. If you put only knowledge here and skill here, this is only going to be theoretical knowledge. This is no education. And this is going to be only skill-based. What we need is a knowledge with the skill. This is what we need. And there has been a proverb. We don't, uh, uh, knowledge without skills is incomplete. And skills without knowledge cannot proceed further. Friends, what is the role of science and technology in the human development? Let me just sum up it up. Improving understanding of threats and possibilities, disasters, and so on and so forth. Enabling advances in technology to drive economic growth via new product services with reduced cost and increased productivity. Reducing resource use and environmental impacts. Managing the competition for land, soil, water, and primary productivity. Mastering energy, economy, environment dilemma. Creating jobs and professions. Meeting the needs of the poor, eradicating poverty and hunger, and improving health. This is that larger message of the theme of the National Science Day 2021. I'll close this presentation by bringing to you the famous statement by Thomas Jefferson made in 1810. The main objective of science is freedom and happiness of man. And would add here the main objective of advanced science is advanced freedom and happiness of man. With this, thank you very much for your patient hearing. Thank you, Professor Jagata, for a fantastic uh, presentation which has really <coughs> raised a whole lot of issues and it has been thought provoking for every one of us who has participated in the meeting. Uh, our sincere thanks for sharing your excellent research on a variety of topics. It is very relevant to today, today the National Science Day, relevant to universities, including HBNI, and re very relevant to the country in general. So we are extremely grateful to you for joining. Uh, I am sure there will be many questions. We have requested people to post them online.
trigger some discussion by sharing a few thoughts with you one is uh, with regard to development of scientific instruments which you really focused on which is uh, now i should say extremely important for the country we do not have even an international standard spectrophotometer in our country i used yes. to i used to ask my uh, colleagues uh, when i was in igcar and uh, when other other interactions with other industries again <coughs> the kind of uh, market it will have in the country because every laboratory every college every school may like to have a spectrophotometer if yes indian spectrophotometer can live up to the international standards in terms of cost and performance if we are able to supply to all the laboratories in the country that itself will be a very great market but yes that, that i realize one point that perhaps perhaps the way it is not happened is i know i know easy i am spectrophotometer but i do not find anyone buying the easy spectrophotometer <coughs> and the reason is it that uh, is it that lack of multidisciplinarity in the country that is uh, interaction collaboration between science scientists engineers and you know marketing management whatever kind of group that kind uh, of environment is yes yeah that's that's an excellent question sir and uh, le, 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 see i was i was doing uh, some study about around the gas chromatograph uh, it was developed uh, by prc until 1990 came up with a very good model very good uh, equipment however there was one thing that was forgotten that the gas chromatographs which were available internationally they had library so that a uh, scientist doesn't have to look for what peak is this uh, you can take care by the library this was the only issue because of which toshin wall abandoned it and, and they became the suppliers of the imported ones now this is what uh, the whole issue is science technology and innovation is like running a 10000 meter race what happens in many of many instances that we run only 9000 meters and that 1000 meter really decides who is a winner and who is not if if the user requires library of uh, gas chromatograph we need to provide that and that is how the instruments can be made at par with the international standard same thing happened with the uh, uh, the equipment that was developed uh, in uh, spectroscopy division the maldi Uh, uh, Dr. Rizvi developed that equipment at par as regards the uh, its performance. However, it did not have the library, uh, and and that creating that library, uh, I don't know why it was found very difficult, and therefore the whole effort of developing indigenously uh, did not realize in a big way. So this is what we need to do. We need to take it to the last level. unfortunately that does not happen uh, or we don't recognize it <clears throat> uh professor grover would like to ask a question but before that i want to share just another philosophical thought so that i can go to the audience uh, don't you think uh, that our society our uh, the, the social paradigm is also partly responsible for this in the sense that uh, every parent however educated he is always connects uh, the education to a job prospect he is he has to get a he has to get a good position and to get salary and whatever uh, branch of uh, study will get him good salary that is the one which is sought after and that is how uh, 10 years ago lots of people shifted from science to information technology just because yes. of the societal impact don't you think this is yes. also responsible this is the first question uh, oh yes mm. with regard to the optimal with the gdp which uh, we have discussed in the beginning <coughs> comparison or for target for improvement whatever don't you think uh, there is something some concept of optimum gdp is it that we have to match china or in or us or develop another indicator but will say this is where we want to go this are my question thank you yeah yeah the first question is very important and that's 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 the reason i started this lecture by uh, talking about the trajectories of 
education, job, and science. These trajectories have never met in a sense that, uh, as I said, that uh, education is a government job. That that is something which is firmly in the minds of Indian people. It's very difficult. It's very difficult to remove. That's where a lot of sensitization will have to be done. In the same manner, the scientists working on exotic problems, we need to sensitize them that, look, this is the way we need to convert. At the same time, uh, the fascination for the goods from abroad, uh, that exists in this society. And that also we need to sensitize. Uh, I used to tell my children the, when they were young, that you know that all these stories, the fairy tales in India, uh, you know, the, that fairy always has a golden hair. That's the way it is told. You know, this was a period when uh, Alexander the Great uh, invaded India and Indians saw lots of uh, blonde uh, women. And therefore, any uh, fairy has to be with the golden uh, hair and not with black hair. Uh, <laughs> this is how it converts our uh, mental faculties into believing in. And fortunately, these are the issues which we should have concentrated uh, socially, not at the scientific level. Socially, we should have concentrated. Unfortunately, the, our social discourse is always away from this. Social discourse is on some politician here, something here, something there, something there, and it it uh, beats. Uh, uh, so I'm with you on this. That uh, large amount of work has to be has to happen in the sociology in this country to change this mindset. Uh, luckily, we can see that, well, uh, uh, as I said, the people used to argue 20 years ago that, uh, uh, well, the people who have seen the partition, uh, those who are bitter about the partition, and as uh, the memories, the societal memories keep uh, fading, uh, then probably people will forget. But that has not happened. These are, these are the marks which people keep talking about it. So there has to be a sociological movement in this country to show that this is what is important for us, and not anything. As regards the GDP, what is the highest GDP that you, what is the standard of living that we want to have? Uh, now the standard of living uh, is decided uh, even not by even America, it is uh, uh, decided by the countries like Sweden and uh, Netherlands. With the very, uh, that matching to that sort of a standard of living is certainly not uh, possible, even during the uh, demographic dividend period, which is anyway going to last till 2058, not beyond that. Uh, and therefore, uh, one would say that, well, if Bangladesh can go to $2,000 per capita, and if we are still stuck up with 1800, uh, there is some problem. Uh, and we need to really look at it carefully and uh, do it. Uh, what about $10,000 per capita? If you do $10,000 per capita, multiply by the population, and you see how many trillions the GDP has to grow. So uh, it's, it's, it's really a mind boggling question. Thank you. Uh, Professor Grover would like to ask a question. Sure. Yeah. Professor Grover, you are able to unmute yourself now? <coughs> just for a moment, just hold for a moment. It's still uh, mute. Can you unmute Professor Grover how to do that? I tried many times. Just unmute himself. Yeah, Professor Grover, go to accept the request and unmute yourself. We have already enabled it here. <laughs> okay. Now it is. Yes, yes. I think uh, Dr. Jagtap, uh, excellent talk. Uh, the way you, you. have uh, 
the integration of content and context I spoken about co evolution of science and society something wonderful and it is said that uh, inspiration is external and this was something which was highlighted by Radha Krishnan in the first uh, commission, education commission immediately after independence. He had pointed out that the center of gravity of exploration in India lies outside India. Yes. Right yes. in 1948, but we still continue to there today. Still, our elite institutions insist on PDFs abroad for positions and limit. That is uh, an issue. Uh, I have uh, comments on two topics. One with regard to the core quadrant model, where you have indicated as the first quadrant, if I go by Slope's uh, uh, presentation, you have presented slightly differently. And you are saying it is a no no. But this is something which uh, originally there are two points of view one which you have articulated, and one was written by Donald Stokes in his book. He says that this quadrant is not empty. And then he compares to use the German word Weissenschaft, which yes. is to the Indian concept of shikha as compared to education as per the Western philosophy. And there's a lot of uh, writing on the fact that education is not the same as Weissenschaft. Weissenschaft and shikha, these two are closer philosophically. And then Donald Stokes talks about how uh, uh, activity of Charles Darwin started in the first quadrant and moved. He dynamically connects that first quadrant to the remaining quadrant which can happen. And he also highlights in his book uh, that the first quadrant is the place where training for research takes place. So I think this is a really point of yes. view. You, you articulated that I heard from some people. But uh, the original concept of Donald Stokes in his book is comparing that vice and I will call it Shiksha, and many people subscribe to that part as well. So this was one comment. Uh, second comment is with regard to the statement which you made that HBNI is not virtual. HBNI has a constituent institutions which are brick and mortar. Everything takes place there. So I want to not mix up uh, this different model and, uh, where, the, where the clusters of 11 constituent institutions. And uh, it's not that uh, we are the only organization where such a model exists. There are other universities of this time. But if I start talking about it, it will take a long time. I'll stop it here. But that is one topic where I like to have a Maybe detailed talk with you on this topic. Thank you. I stop here. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you, Professor Grover. Uh, uh, I'll uh, take the first question. Yes, indeed. The originally the third quadrant in the uh, master quadrant model, uh, where there is no applications and no new knowledge, uh, was originally thought of uh, like this is where the education is can sit in uh, and. Uh, their work is important, but uh, it does not lead to any new knowledge or new technology, something like that. Uh, however, if we interpret it in terms of the Indian context, then uh, I would interpret it like this, that uh, if I do any scientific activity, which does not result in any fundamental knowledge and which does not result in any applications, then all that my work will enter into that third quadrant, which I call as a no-no quadrant. And I thought that this particular uh, interpretation is pretty good. Uh, the reason is uh, like this, that uh, um, when I get a PhD student, then I will tell him that, look, uh, your objective is to get one paper because that is what UGC requires. So right in the beginning, my motivation for research does not happen to be 
the knowledge or application it happens to be something else uh, in a larger context uh, we can see here that uh, the way we have incorporated the promotion systems for the uh, faculty in the universities this is for the api points you need to have so many papers you need to have this now those people really indeed publish papers but the whole objective is to get a promotion and not uh, some knowledge or some application so all that work enters into the no no order so this was an interpretation in the indian context and then it gives also a measure that uh, when i speak to the universities and institutions also that just ask a question that this is a no no quadrant how much of your work enters into this quadrant which has which has no new knowledge or which has no new application and then the people will start with the 10% 20% they will keep increasing the stacks they will go up to 50% and then i would say fine i i understand that the reason for this is where are the papers being published even if i grant them that uh, thing um, i have seen papers being published from a journal which is published from morocco south africa and uh, closer home delhi or muradabad and things like that so that is how we keep doing that this is when ugc has uh, does accept papers in many of this so that's why i had defined this is no no quadrant does not help the country uh, second point is yes uh, i i will take back my words uh, hbni is a full fledged university uh, and therefore whatever we talk about the universities is applicable to it and therefore uh, Uh, i would say in a larger sense the social responsibility the university taking the social responsibility of uh, the localities uh, that also becomes then part of yours uh, and and i'll be very happy uh, 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 professor grover i would like to also add something here uh, which uh, uh, i think this is more in the policy of uh, policies on your side but i have a suggestion see if you look at now i mean since you have worked at brns for uh, so many years uh, if you look at over the years uh, the university research was going down in 70s 80s and then there was a initiative that the national institute should mentor the research in universities this is what uh, started in 80s and also and also those uh, Uh, uh teachers if they do not have phd they should go to iits and do phd something like that which just started what started happening was i mean this is my analysis of the situation that those university faculty started working on our problems rather than working on their problems so now uh, this is a second level transfer because it my inspiration is from research done abroad that's the research i am doing and i am implanting that research now onto somebody who is from a university system uh it has not created a very good ambience in the uh, research in this people have been uh, working on high tc superconductors in the universities uh, today they are working on nanotechnology you go to a small university and as a student as a student How do you make your nano materials? The sir, वो stove पे गरम करता हूँ और उसका थोड़ा थोड़ा हिस्सा इस lab में analysis के लिए भेज देता हूँ. So this is the kind of PhD research that happens. Instead of that, can HBNI not encourage the people, faculty, to come up with their local problems, which can be funded by a scientist? Funded by BRNS and technical help from DAE organization. See, the university's feet have to be rooted in soil because those students have to do these uh, jobs. They are interested in jobs. They are interested in entrepreneurship, and they are interested in many of this. And therefore, if somebody like the example which I said that there is a course now, this needs to be purified. this problem can come from a faculty in a, in a small place uh, brns gives uh, funding then assign some chemist there if it a chemistry related problem 
get it done over three years and DAE can retain the patent rights. This is going to generate a larger, uh, larger applications in the country and DAE can claim those applications as theirs rather than putting them into the reactor controls or nuclear fuel kind of a research. This, is, this has been, uh, I have been thinking about it for uh, last 15, 20 years, but today was the opportunity to uh, talk about this. Professor Grover, would you like to respond? Yes, uh, I, I, I would like to also <coughs> mention that you know, this is a topic which of uh, interest to HBNI and BRS. And yes, definitely it's, uh, it is a worth uh, discussing. But this is probably since both of us are in the BRS forum, we would uh, take it up at some point in the next. Uh, 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 sir, uh, I, I'll, I'll tell you one uh, very interesting. I have been hearing about Goargam since uh, 2014 or so. Okay. Uh, in, in a discussion a couple of days ago, somebody made a statement that uh, uh, Gawar gum is bought by China and they extract uh, gum and uh, government of India made a project report and this and that. I keep wondering that, look, uh, what the local university is doing. They can take Gawar gum. It's an extraction problem. Uh, they can, uh, it, it, it can work with, uh, let's say, 5 lakhs of rupees of budget. doesn't involve more money. Scaling up, yes, that's a separate issue. Uh, so there is no point in saying that the Gawar gum is being sold abroad at 100 rupees a kg and the oil is sold at 1 lakh rupees a kg. Look, that processing, it can, I mean, this is a problem that uh, will not be... Uh, uh, seen by a BRC officer or BRC scientist, I can understand that. But somebody who is local there in the universities, he can propose that program, can come up with the project proposal. Uh, DAE can assign, it's an extraction, some bioorganic chemist or somebody like that, and execute that project. And the whole Gwargam extraction patent can be taken by DAE. This is the way I would think about the whole problem. No, I, I do agree with Professor uh, Jaktam. The reason I was giving that response was, first of all, it requires a bigger forum. Second, uh, unfortunately, I and mean, I should say, since we started a little late, uh, we need to close uh, soon because we have another program on the international... Yes, yes. Radio yeah. activity. Uh, yeah. So, I need a break. Uh, so, unless there are very uh, in, uh, other questions from any other person in the audience, uh, We'll wait for a minute, but I thought that uh, we, should, we may have to stop soon. That is why I didn't go into the detail. I do agree your point is very important. We will take it up uh, separately. Maybe we will invite you for a discussion on this more detail. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Yes. I'll join you. Well, since uh, I do not find uh, any other questions in the chat mode, uh, <coughs> probably we have just already transgressed into the lunchtime of many people. And uh, uh, unfortunately, the technology did not support us uh, at the beginning. But I'm glad that uh, they did do very smoothly and uh, I thank you for a very inspiring lecture. And as usual, this, uh, our, all our HBNI webinars are available on the internet, on the YouTube, under HBNI yes. webinar channel. And uh, usually what we find is uh, the viewership increases the uh, same evening because people are uh, people are engaged in office work who cannot attend this talk. Many of them observe, come to that later. So I'm sure that your message and your talk will uh, go through many more minds as the days go along and we hope we will have uh, once the pandemic is over we'll have a physical interaction where this can this uh, discussion can take yes more detail. thank you yeah. very much for joining and uh, thanks a lot uh, we would like to stop yeah, yeah. thanks